Hello, I'm Jean Palin, Chair of the Holmes Beach City Commission and the Chair of the Manatee County Animal Services Advisory Board. Current estimates are that between four and five million dogs and cats are killed in municipal shelters every year. It's not uncommon that well more than half of the cats and dogs that end up in municipal shelters die there. Those statistics held true for Manatee County Animal Services. Despite the best efforts of rescue groups, about 50% of all dogs and cats that came into animal services were killed there. Many of us in the community felt helpless to do anything about the situation, except to save as many dogs and cats as we could. We believed there was no real fix. We believed there were just too many dogs and cats and too many irresponsible owners. Then one day in 2011, a group of five people from Manatee County traveled to a no-kill conference in Houston, Texas. There we heard a visionary man named Nathan Winograd talk about no-kill and the no-kill equation. Three of those attendees are in this group that will talk to you today. We all came home from that conference knowing that not only could we make Manatee County a no-kill county, we had to do it. And in fact, we had no choice about it not if we were going to continue to call ourselves animal lovers. In October 2011, the county commission declared that Manatee County would become the first no-kill county in the state of Florida. Here today to talk about Manatee County's journey to no-kill are some of the prime participants. Carol Whitmore is a county commissioner she has been the political leader of the journey to no-kill, shepherding the no-kill resolution through the county commission. Bill Hutchison is the director of public safety in Manatee County and has been responsible for oversight of Manatee's animal services. Chris Weisskopf is the head of Manatee County Animal Services and has been the prime figure responsible for changing his agency from kill to no-kill. Sue Colsey is the vice president of Animal Network an umbrella organization that does its own rescues, plus supports animal services and other groups. Mary Lupi is the president of Safe Haven Animal Rescue of Florida, a rescue organization that didn't really like the old animal services, but approves of the new direction. Her group has rescued many dogs from animal services and elsewhere. I'd like to start this, and this is going to be hard because we're all in love with the subject, so we're, we're going to try to take it one at a time. Bill, let me turn to you first. As the Director of Public Safety in Manatee County, what's the definition of no-kill in Manatee County? Well, for us, no-kill is uh, 91, 92 percent of all of the animals that come in the back door walk out the front door. <laughs> That's a great way home. to put it. Yeah. Um, are there just a certain number of animals that cannot be saved that are too ill or too something? Yes. Um, some animals come in that have been injured. There's just no way to save them. Some animals are vicious. Um, after evaluation, it's determined that those animals just can't be rehabilitated, so those animals are put down. Right. And some animals are old. Um, it's, they're just beyond uh, being marketable. I know that's a... Mm -hmm. Um, a crass word, but that's what it, that's what we do. We right. market our animals to people, right. to new homes, and some of them just can't be marketed. So, eight percent right. is is the number that we try to keep it to. Right. All right. We know you're fairly high up in the county government. What oh. drew you personally to this issue? You had a lot of responsibilities other than stray dogs and cats. Well, I'm a cat guy. Ah. <laughs> I have um, seven cats, all of which came from animal services uh -huh. and in fact in my first meeting these ladies down here referred to me as the cat hoarder so, <laughs> um, but uh, I love animals um, I've always loved animals I've had horses I've had dogs I've had hamsters and goldfish and the, right. the gamut good okay let me move Carol the political process I, I think uh, animal rescue groups 
are not political people in the sense of how do you get an ordinance changed or how do you get something to be accepted by the, by the lawmakers. Um, you are the lawmaker on the county commission. How, what, what did it take to get no kill to be approved in Manatee County? Well, it took people like the people you see here at the table today to show up in my office one day and demanded. Um, you know, I sat and listened and said, yeah, sure, and met with staff and said, we're doing that. And then we just, uh, they, would, they wouldn't give up. They kept at my door. They kept educating me more. And then really the turning point for all of Manatee County is when this group of, uh, of people went and heard Nathan Winograd. Um, my job has always been to carry the message. My job has just been to keep it in the commissioner's face. And it took, we worked on this for about three or four years before it actually came to mm -hmm. fruition. And what I did is, in a political sense is I just brought it up at commission meetings. I asked to be appointed to be the animal liaison with Manatee County as there had never been a county commissioner at animal services ever, uh -huh. um, except to turn in a dog, I, from what I understood. <laughs> so um, I, I just did that and um, I kept it in my commissioner's face. I kept educating them on what was going to happen. And then when it came to actually voting on it, they had already been educated. They'd been through the process, and it was easy after that. That's great. Um, we, I mentioned at the top of the show the no-kill equation. Um, there are 11 steps to no-kill. By steps, that means there are 11 sort of parts of a successful no-kill program. And I'd like to talk about those steps, and there are 11 of them, so we can't spend too much time on any one of them. Let me go first. Sue, let me ask you, um, an important part, one important part of, of a no-kill program is to have a feral cat trap neuter release program. What is that? Feral, and it also includes free-roaming cats. It's feral cats or unsocialized cats. Free-roaming are usually the cats that are left behind by people that move or turn them out. Mm -hmm. It's important to have that program because we trap them we get them neutered, and then we re-release them where they came from. What this does is we have colony managers that manage the colonies. Mm -hmm. it help, that helps prevent sick animals from being in the colony, but most importantly, the animals are spayed and neutered, and they're not reproducing more and more feral cats. Got it. A um, female cat comes into heat every two months, mm -hmm. so you can imagine how many cats would be born right. if it wasn't for TNR. Do we know if we're tracking at all about whether colonies are getting smaller? through TNR? You may not know this. I was just curious. I don't know. There's a group named Gulf Shore Animal mm -hmm. League that works hand-in-hand -hand with the TNR program, right. and they, I'm sure they're tracking it. Right. Um, Chris, are you comfortable with where our feral cat program is in Manatee County for no-kill purposes? I am, and if I can add, um, we liter literally, I believe, have um, cut our intake of cats in half wow. from what it used oh, to be. Wow. Um, so we've made huge strides in that part of that Nathan Winograd's program for that. Wow. Absolutely. Okay. Um, the second important step in becoming a no-kill area is high volume, low cost spay and neuter services. Um, Chris, do you know what programs are available, high cost or free? Programs. Yes. Well, we're, we're fortunate in this county that our commission has um, allocated funding for us to have a no-cost spay-neuter program. Mm -hmm. um, so between the Animal Rescue Coalition, who has a mobile clinic, and the Humane Society of Manatee County, mm -hmm. we have um, two good groups that uh, qualify uh, low-cost or no-cost for um, low-income uh, uh, right. qualified pet owners. And those these low cost or free programs are open to all citizens? They are. And is, how would they know about it? Um, you can actually contact our hotline at, uh, number at 749-3067. Again, 749-3067. And that's just a spay-neuter hotline? That's a spay-neuter hotline. It'll give all the information you need. 749-3069 um, will get you all the information for that's our great. clinics. That's great, okay. Rescue groups. Mary, you're here, although we know there are many rescue groups out there in Manatee mm -hmm. County. Any, I, did anybody ever count? I think I've many? been in all of them, so don't, <laughs> don't go there. <laughs> I know of, I, I would say 20 or 30, wouldn't you? Definitely. Rescue groups, mm -hmm. some large, some Probably small. Probably more. More, yeah. Yeah, Definitely. really, yes. really. And what, describe to me what part you see rescue groups playing in No Kill. It, it, they play a very big part because we, our volunteers, a lot of these groups cannot have a, a shelter or a, uh, a place where they can 
keep these animals, so we work strictly with fosters. And you figure if you have 30 rescue groups and each one has 30 or 40 or 70 or 80 fosters, each one of those homes can house an animal that can eventually be adopted. Yes. So that, that's a tremendous amount of animals. And we, and we need these groups because they help. They help with pulling the animals. They also help in being a voice in the government. That is so important. People need to talk up and say, hey, listen, we want this no-kill to succeed. Yes. And that's the way it gets done. Right. I would say that we wouldn't be here today without the pressure that the rescue groups put on us. I was us thinking about that. Amen. Absolutely. I, I remember at one point, maybe I, we're not going to name any names, but at one point there was some negative talk possibly within the county commission about, was it about no-kill specifically? Mm -hmm. uh, and all of a sudden, uh, a lot of what we call the yellow shirts, green, green shirts, green green. the green shirts, <laughs> all the, the animal rescue groups showed up en masse. 300 at least. At least 300 and got great mm -hmm. TV, that great press. A, yeah. That was based on a rumor that animal services budget might be cut, cut. back That's a little. That's right. That's yeah. right. And within three hours, 300 people mobilized yes. to come down and speak yeah. their the piece. Power of the people. So, and the base of that mobilization are animal rescue groups. Yes. Right. Yeah. Definitely, so. without a doubt. Exactly. Right. Mary, how has, has anything changed at animal services <laughs> since you've been doing this? Quite a bit. Talk, Quite me, a bit. talk me a little bit about that. I, I see a tremendous change for the better. I mean, honestly, Chris has done a great job the people under him, the people he has working there, the commissioners, everybody, it's, it's the whole group. And just the fact that all these animals are being saved. Years ago, it, it was unbelievable how many animals were euthanized and they were perfectly good adoptable animals. But we had no, they had no people coming down to adopt them and this here, it, what, you need the community. It takes a community to save a community of animals, basically. Mm -hmm. And this is what Chris has embraced and the whole county has embraced. You know, an interesting thing, I'm going a little off script here um, to, ask, to ask Chris. I remember I heard you say one time something that really made an impression on me, which is you didn't want to be a dog catcher or something mm -hmm. akin to that. Absolutely. Um, and your job had been being a dog catcher. That's correct. And most of the <laughs> county, I think like every other county, didn't really want to know anything besides that that stray dog was picked up or that stray cat was picked up. That's right. And so y I can't imagine what the morale was for you in animal services prior to the thoughts of no-kill. Talk to me a little about that. It was basically just a revolving door that we had. The dogs and cats would come into the facility, um, stay there there five, seven, ten days. Uh, whatever owner didn't come to claim them, there was really nothing to do but expect that overcrowding. So to avoid that, uh, they were just uh, killed. That must have been terribly demoralizing to the people who worked at Animal Services. It was. It was very difficult. We had a... Um, high turnover rate oh, um, yeah. and I do remember one time specifically out of seven shelter staff five were gone in a week we wow. were down to two shelter staff and that's just because of burnout uh, right. and 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 the fact that they have to euthanize yeah. these animals it's just a uh, compassion fatigue right right what's the difference now mm -hmm. what does it feel like now at animal services? Well, the animals all that come in, they know have a very good chance of getting back out alive. So mm -hmm. when they're seeing what the commission has done, what the rescues have done, with all of these programs and services put into place of how it, it is happening to the positive, the morale is boosted itself way up. They're actually being recognized. The, the rescues are coming over and, uh, and recognizing what they have done and, wow. and how far we have succeeded so right. it, it's a big morale booster for them no yes. doubt that's Indeed, pretty if wonderful. I could add one thing to uh, what yeah. Chris said uh, this is something that the, um, the average citizen in Manatee County may not know or realize but Florida statutes mandate animal control services that mm -hmm. part is capturing the animals protecting the public uh, but that's where this mandate stops it's just to control the animals mm. What we do with adoption programs and the kinds of things that we're doing here today, uh, we do by choice um, right. because important. it's a quality of life issue for well, us. Well, a very important thing to say, I'm glad you said that, Bill, because Carol, 
Didn't we promise the county commission that no kill was not going to cost the taxpayers one more penny? And we sure did. And I don't know how we've done it, but we've done it. We've uh, been creative. There's many things that we're doing at the county. Our tag fees, our um, I received a grant thanks to a lot of people in this room that wrote a grant on my behalf with Tampa Bay Lightning a Community Heroes Award and I received fifty thousand dollars and twenty eight thousand of it went to a ventilation system mm -hmm. in the CAT area and I want to thank you all for that mm -hmm. and the rest is I'm a nurse for those of a lot of people that don't know the rest of that is for medications to keep these animals alive and out to fosters or out to um, homes that can care for them right. and a lot of the reasons why they haven't been is they can't afford to take care of them, like heartworm and etc but now we have that uh, method right. to do well, that. I'm going to come back to you because I really want to talk about medical and what that means and how it's changed. Um, but I, I think it's important for our listeners or our viewers to know that um, you can do this without more government money. Mm -hmm. It would be nicer to have more government money, of course. <laughs> but you can do it without, it, it's not expense, more expensive to do no-kill, as long as you can get community involvement and community Community's support. everything. Yeah, yes. for it, OK. Um, probably a, a, big, a big issue that's come up, I know Animal Services is working with this one, is foster care for animals. Um, all of the rescue groups, I think, depend on foster care. We wouldn't for, be here. Right, right. And I have firsthand experience. I'm going to talk about this a little bit because I've been a foster, I call myself a fair weather foster mother. I've been a foster mother for um, another rescue group, Underdog Rescue of Florida, for a number of years now. And it's such a wonderful, it's so critical to have a working foster program. And I think because when the dogs come into animal services, they are traumatized. Mm -hmm. They have either been on the streets mm -hmm. or they have been neglected, abused, or they have been turned in by their owners and just lost the only home they ever knew. Mm -hmm. So when the dogs and the cats too come in, they are sure. traumatized. Yes. And I think that the foster home is such a critical piece to, for a lot of reasons, for their mental and physical health, but also to make them more adoptable. Um, dogs that aren't socialized get socialized or get comfortable or get more secure than they were. So I think it's pretty critical. And I know each rescue group has, has its own foster program. Mm -hmm. um, I would love to see a senior foster program started, mm -hmm. I have to say. I'm actually trying to start that right now. Are you really? Yes. For I'm... senior people or senior dogs? Both. <laughs> okay. Dogs and cats. Dogs and, and cats. I have, we have a senior home out east with uh, 25 mm -hmm. senior cats. Wow. And I'm trying to get volunteers to go out there to, to because after only being in a home for, with 25 cats with one person, they're starting to lose their, uh, you know, their love of humans, oh, so you sure. have to get volunteers. And I just connected with an organization that maybe is going to be willing to help us oh, because wow. they're highly adoptable. Mm -hmm. I don't care how old they are. Right. I have a ten-year-old Chihuahua that I got from Animal Services last week. Right. That is, he's a whip. He is fantastic. <laughs> I have five people on my block willing to adopt him, but they're not right. old enough. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. I always tell the story. My sister recently adopted a 10-year-old blind, uh, blind Shih Tzu. Uh -huh. And she says, That's just one old broad helping another. <laughs> That's I love it. Um, Chris, what about in animal services? Do you, does animal services have a foster program? We do. And of course, we can build on our foster program that we have. We have right now transition fosters. What they're what does that mean transition? What they're responsible for is, of course, our first goal is to get the animal out of the get the dog or cat out of the shelter. Mm -hmm. So if we get it into this home and that is a foster transition home, that person that is fostering is responsible for making sure it gets out to adoption events. In essence, they're responsible for that animal making sure it gets to its permanent forever home. I see. So it's more than just housing the animal. It they is. are in part part of the chain to get them adopted, to right. get them. And we're just asking people that have room, even if it's just as small as having a bathroom, that they have that extra little bit of room wow. that they can do for our, for our pets. Wow, 
That's pretty neat. Is, is your foster program thriving, or, or is that an area where you're still needing We're help? lacking. I think we need some help in that, in that area, and that's why we're asking anybody that has any room, love in their heart, compassion for animals, but don't want to be a permanent home themselves. Mm -hmm. I mean, this way they can get a variety of dogs and cats into their home and, and just get them into the forever home. So We're going to talk about medical later, but one note in here. What about heartworm positive dogs? That used to be a death sentence for dogs coming into animal services. That's Do right. you send heartworm positive dogs out to foster care or adoption? We will, and that is a program that is being started now uh, that is just beginning really? by one of our um, good volunteers. Um, not that they're all not good, but right. um, one of our main volunteers that's doing that, she's going to call it the Have a Heart program. Oh, how wonderful. So what's going to be good is this is coming up with um, when Valentine's Day comes as well. Mm -hmm. So um, animal services will pay for all the heartworm treatment. Right. So that's whether it's adopted or not, or whether it's in foster or not. They need about anywhere between one and two and a half months, three months of quiet time um, right. without overexertion. Right. Uh, to be able to pull through the heartworm treatments. So. Right. The only problem for fosters taking heartworm, in my own experience, is I usually get heartworm dogs because I only keep one dog at a time, and so I can keep them quiet. Mm -hmm. And But the problem is you have them longer. <laughs> you, know? right. you have them longer and you get more attached, yes. a little more attached. Well, this is where that word, that foster failure yeah. comes yeah. in. Yeah. So. yeah, I know. Yeah. I know. It's a positive term, not negative. I know. But I always want, want to tell people out there, everyone I talk to, I know and I tell them I do that, and they say, oh, I couldn't possibly do that. I'd get too attached. Mm -hmm. And I want to say, you know, it's just an entirely different mentality. Mm -hmm. You know, I got attached to my children, too, but they left home, and I was fine <laughs> with that. You know, you've got to go into it with the mentality that you're taking care of this dog and helping it to get to its forever home. Yeah. Right. You know, that's what you have to go into it with. And then it's totally rewarding it to is. work yes, to I do. Tell you, I, I take in a lot of foster dogs. Yeah. And Every once in a while, my husband says to me, this would be a nice dog to keep. And yeah. I go, uh-uh. <laughs> right. There's another home out there waiting for him. Yes, exactly. I've exactly. taken a lot of foster cats, and the roles are reversed. Yeah. I say, no, <laughs> we're not keeping them. Right. <laughs> <laughs> what about the next step after fostering really is adoption? And even though that's just listed as one of the steps to no-kill, you know, one of the no-kill equation steps, for me, that's the heart of everything, is, is adoptions. Um, Chris, compare, this is, I don't mean to put you on the spot, but did you have a real adoption program prior to our movement to No Kill? No, we had um, an availability of animals that were for adoption, I guess right. you could say a lack of better term for it, but um, now we have true marketing of animals, we're working on them on the internet, we have them on Facebook, and we have a good core group of volunteers that are also helping post them and, and it's getting the word out. Um, your monthly specials that we have, we have um, um, uh, j just a whole multitude of programs to be able to, to make an awareness, I guess if you could say, mm -hmm. uh, if, that we have dogs and cats available because there's some people that think that we are just an intake facility. Mm -hmm. so. um, I know what helped a lot in Manatee County too was opening a downtown adoption center. Manatee County, like most counties or, or, or municipalities, put their dog catcher out in the boonies somewhere, yeah. which makes them hard to get to. They're very often closed, you know, when people are off of work. And it's very difficult. And so talk a little bit about the downtown center. Who do we have at the downtown center? Well, the downtown center uh, initially started with just one abandoned office space. Right. And because of the success that it came, in fact, uh, a big success uh, with dog walkers, uh, people coming from downtown, right. um, we expanded to another section. So now we have a dog section and a cat section. Right. And there's an awareness. Everybody knows where our downtown adoption center is. So that's been a huge positive for animal services. Yeah. And Jane, we actually got the idea from Honor 
rescue. And Bill and I went to East Bradenton to see uh, their shopping center where BJ's is, the, the, the store BJ's. We went there and saw their downtown. We thought, this is great. How on can we do that? And also a Cat Depot on 17th Street. Yes, um, right. Those because you put the animals where the people are. Right, exactly. exactly. I mean, exactly. It, just, it goes right. to what I mentioned earlier about marketing. I mean, we're, right. we're in the business of marketing our animals. But exactly. before, we were in the wholesale side of it. Yeah. Now we have a retail side, which right. is the downtown adoption side. Right. And what a lot of people don't realize is animal services, we have to take every animal that comes in. Yes. Rescues don't. Uh, some of the other bigger shelters in Manatee County don't. Right. Manatee County, we have to take all the animals. Yeah. That's right. That's right. That, and so for a, a municipal shelter that has to take animals to declare no kill is just amazing, really, if you think about it. I mean, that, it's pretty, it was pretty, pretty scary. amazing. Yeah, I, I would think so. You know, I know the downtown center, what I love about it, I took my granddaughter to visit the downtown adoption center when she was here. And of course the cat rooms where you can just go in and play with the cats, pet the cats, sit with them. Like 20 of them. Oh my time. goodness. <laughs> you know, it's such, a, it's an attraction. It's like a tourist attraction to yes. come there and Wonderful. play with the cats. I just love the fact that at lunchtime during the week, you go down to Main yes. Street and the dog walkers are out. And a lot of them are county workers that spend their lunch hour walking the dogs. I know a few of them. Yes. And I think just from that, it facilitates lots of adoptions because people are sitting there at restaurants and they go, wow, that's a nice looking dog. Right. And they say, oh, that dog's up for adoption. <laughs> right. Mm -hmm. And it really works. That's all it has to be done is let the people see the animals, they will adopt them. Yeah, absolutely. That's absolutely right. I talked to someone the other day who said, I came in to get a little white fluffy, uh -huh. and then this big brown dog you know, <laughs> just jumped up and licked my face, and it was all over. What's nice is that the dog walkers, they are all interested in the animals, and they all have favorites, which is normal, yeah. and they push those animals. They're like, oh, go over and pet them. It's okay. Oh, he, he could sit. He could stay. He could do everything. Right. And it really works. So right. the program is fantastic. I can't say enough about it. All right, so, so part of a comprehensive adoption program, you said, Chris, we have the, the media, or uh, what do you call it, you know, Facebook. Right. There's a name for that. The social media. Social Thanks, media. thank you, social yes. media. Um, you also have um, PR, publicity, through your column. You write a newspaper column for every week yes. on a, some different aspect of, of animals or dogs and cats or animal services or adoptions or whatever the topic is. Right. Um, and then we have the downtown center, bring, bring the dogs there. Mm -hmm. um, we also have, uh, Sue, talk a little bit about, I know, or maybe Chris and Sue, one of the issues in the past has been getting the dogs to events. There are a million events around, yes. adoption events yes. around, and in the past, the problem has been there are the animals out in Palmetto sitting in their cages, and how do you get them? You know, uh, other than paying overtime, which we can't ask the county to do because it's not going to cost anything. Right. How do we get animals to where the people are who want to adopt? In the past, it's been that a few of our volunteers with big vans pick some up and bring them. Yeah. Now what we're doing is buying a van that's equipped with cages inside of it that the volunteers will be, it'll be stationed at Animal Services. It's a no-kill van, and they will transport the animals from Animal Services to the event and be able to bring them back. Now, lest anyone think we're loaded with money, we're that not. we're buying an old, we're buying a used animal services yes, used van that's going very out used. of service, right? Yes. And that would go to auction if we didn't grab it up. Yes, but my long-term goal, and I want to do a fundraiser for this, is to get a mobile adoption van, RV type bus, like the Sarasota Humane Society has. And what's the difference? What is that? It's much larger. It's built with windows on the outside with the cats right in the cages facing the outside and the dogs facing the outside. It's completely self-contained for adoption events. Oh, I've never seen it. Oh, Very it's wonderful. Neat. It's wonderful. So that's, I don't have the price on it yet, but I'll be arranging well, events to pay for it. you can't it. take cats out. They get very no, upset. No. So that's the perfect vehicle mm -hmm. wow. to show cats on right. the road. And you right. can also take dogs and offload them oh, yeah. so people can see now, them Now we the also events, have so. some that we've had for a while, like for cats with uh, contracts with, or arrangements with um, like PetSmart, mm -hmm. yes? Animal Network's Kitty Corner is the adoption partner at PetSmart. We're under contract. We have the cats in the cages there. We maintain them. We do the adoptions, but they're always there, and they are rescue cats that PetSmart allows us to have, have in their building. 
That's great. Which is wonderful. Is it so far just PetSmart, or do we have any other pet yes. stores that are playing? We also have some of our cats at Perks for Pets out uh, behind Five Guys on Manatee oh, Avenue. Sure. They keep two or three at a time, and the cats just wander around the store and befriend the people and right. become lap cats, and Kenny doesn't want to give them up, but he finally does. Golf Shore right. also has one Golf at Shore has them pet at supermarket. Pet Supermarket. They have. Yes. Yes, they're, they're, they that's the rescue. They bring their cats there. They allow right. them to. Mm -hmm. which is There's great. a program I would love to see get started here that I heard about I think we've talked about it in Arizona. I think it's in Phoenix where they call them cats go to business or something yes. like that. Yes, we're working um, on that too. And where they they foster the cats out to businesses, local businesses. Mm -hmm. And I don't know how they control them running out the door, but however they do it, then the cats are there and they're available for adoption. Yes. So it's all we're good. We're working on that. Right. Yeah. Good. Okay, let's move on. Pet retention. Chris, what does this mean, pet retention? Pet retention, um, our biggest goal is to not have a dog or cat enter our facility in the first place. Ah. Um, biggest way, that uh, biggest program that we did was to equip each one of our animal services officers with a scanner, microchip scanner. Uh -huh. So that is a huge potential that that dog or cat in the field, should a neighbor call, should somebody call, should they come across a loose dog or cat, first thing they're gonna do is look for an identification tag if one doesn't exist. They're gonna use that scanner that they've been issued and they're going to get microchip information. There is a very, very high chance that that dog or cat is going home without ever coming into our facility. Right. And, and that's, happened, that's happened quite often. That's really wonderful because caring owners more and more are getting their dogs microchipped. They are. Mm -hmm. And there used to be a lot of tragic stories about dogs going into animal services and when it used to be in some areas it was three days and they were killed, not Manatee right. County. But, and there were a lot of tragic stories about people losing their pets who went into animal control or animal services and, and, and died there. Mm -hmm. So, Absolutely. you know, that's really wonderful. What other aspects of pet retention? Are there? Um, one of the, uh, another huge one is we have a database that once that animal unfortunately does enter our facility, photograph is taken and a whole intake process. Within one hour of that an animal entering our facility, it is posted on the internet. So anyone can go to our website, look up our lost and found area. They're able to identify it. And we have had several people that call us or come in that say, I saw my dog, I know you have it. I know you had a dog brought in there that belonged to somebody in Texas? That has happened as well. Is that and right? A, and a lot of and that And I've forgotten is how they got identified. Through microchip, microchip. through microchip. Amazing, and microchip. they drove from Texas to come get the dog. Yeah. That's correct, yes. And a Pennsylvania dog. Yes, mm -hmm. that is well. right. There's also another aspect of pet retention, isn't there? What happens when people come in and say, I can't take care of this dog anymore. I can't afford it. I can't afford to buy food or the dog is a behavior problem. The good thing is, is we have a food bank mm -hmm. that if food is an issue, we'll start you out with something just to get you by. Of course, then we try to get them to spay and neuter it if it's not already sure. done so that they can continue with the food bank part of it. If it's a behavioral issue, we do have uh, contact information that we put them in touch with people that are behaviorists. If they have um, um, grooming issues, we can put them in contact with groomers. And of course, we're always looking for building that database. So right. if anyone out there is interested in being part of the behavior side of it, the grooming side, side of it, the, um, they want to donate some feed, that's good as well. What if I'm a person who just comes into animal services and says, here, take my dog? You have, we do two days a week that you have to make an appointment. It has to be and a minimum. Why? What, talk about the purpose of that, because I think it's important for people to hear. What we do is we tell everybody that they need to rethink mm -hmm. their process. They need to rethink of where that animal is going to go. We want to be the absolute last resort. So we try to direct them, like I was saying with, uh, with some of the groomers, the behaviorists, um, if it's just that they don't want it, period. We try to get them with family members, uh, mm -hmm. uh, friends, somebody, us like a last resort. So what this does is they have a minimum of 24 hours, we do them on Tuesdays and Fridays, that they have to return for a full interview. It used to be too easy. Yeah. I mean, right. uh, the people would come and bring their animals, no questions asked. They would drop them off, and that was the end of it. Right. And um, we actually had some folks from the Humane Society come in and help right. our intake people 
manage that initial contact with the um, with the pet owner to try right. to make sure. Are you sure? You know, sometimes it's called a good old fashioned guilt trip, but you just yeah. you, you make sure that this is what you want to do because you know what's going to happen to your animal if you leave it here. Yeah, that's the way. It well, used to here's be. an interesting question that came up the other day when I was talking to a group. Since we're becoming no kill, mm -hmm. isn't it easier for people to turn their animals into us in the sense of getting rid of the guilt, their own guilt? Exactly. Is that a problem? That's exactly true. Yes. Mm -hmm. I've sat is. there waiting for a, a dog to be processed and people walked in with an animal that they had had for like 10 years and they were just giving it up because they were getting a puppy. Oh. And I, had, I just, I, I couldn't believe it. Yeah. But they really spoke to them at the front desk and they left with the dog. What happened, I don't know, but I'm hoping that they kept it because it's, yeah. it is too easy. Yeah. You know, a lot of people just Well, it feel. takes away the guilt. I mean, when people thought, if I take the dog here, it's going to be killed, exactly. they may have gone to some more, more lengths. So it's, it's one thing. But there's also got to be a percentage of people who come in because they're just sort of at their wit's end about it and who can yeah. be, with support, can keep their dog. Definitely. I mean, we right. get calls all the time, right. and we help people. I'll get him a trainer, I'll do anything I need to do to keep that dog in that home. Right. And that's the most important thing we can do. Wow. Okay, let's talk, let's move along to number seven in the no-kill equation, which is medical and behavioral programs. Um, Carol, you're a nurse, so I'm gonna turn to you. And a lot of the, the award that you got, the grant that you got from Tampa Bay Lightning was intended to be used for the health of the animals who were in, um, in the shelter. So how are medical issues being addressed at animal services? Has anything changed as a result of no-kill? A lot's changed. Uh, we have a wonderful vet on staff. It's Dr. Luke Berglund of Beach Vet. He was part of the team before we started the no-kill, but he actually was part of the solution, too. Mm -hmm. um, what we did is Bill met with them, Chris met with them. We had powwows together, and we, they visited his office and his, um, his shelter when he keeps animals, you know, when they're sick, and just to see how he did things. And Luke decided to start making monthly rounds at well, animal we services. A, we for, put a full court press on him. We sure did. <laughs> well, I was trying to be political. I'm a politician. <laughs> so what we did, you know, being a nurse, uh, you know, I demand, if I'm going to say I'm going to do something, you're going to receive an animal and it's going to be healthy and I'm going to assure that all, all that we can and, and we all are. We want to uh, we want to send out healthy animals. So what Luke agreed to do is he makes monthly rounds. Mm -hmm. He uh, established protocols with us because the cleaning solutions mm -hmm. we were using, um, the rescues weren't happy with it, we really weren't happy. He established cleaning protocols of the kennels. He um, changed a lot of medications from regular medicines where you're not sure if the animal really gets all the medicines, especially the cat, they have mm -hmm. this Veni mask on now, so that they were getting the full dosages. He, we um, separated the intake of cats, the sick cats, and then the healthy cats in separate rooms. And then part of the money that I received went to that ventilation system because it was an old air conditioner and they were just recycling bad air. Yeah, talk about that. We had a big upper respiratory infection problem with called? cats, right? What was it called? Feline, upper respiratory. It was just upper an upper respiratory, respiratory yeah. and, and they call it something, but I can't remember. And it remember. was airborne. Airborne, and every time a little cat sneezed, it went on to Again. everyone in there. So then everybody was being medicated, and we did hear concerns from people in the in the community that were adopting animals that were sick, and then from the rescue world. That's completely changed. It's done. Um, Air and Energy uh, won the bid on it, and they did a wonderful job. Uh, and now um, those cats are being um, separated and it's, it's happened a lot better. Now we've also gotten many ideas from rescues. Rescues were saying, you know, um, you, always, you have to wait until the animal comes in before you vaccinate them. Then there's another wait period, so you can't get them out to us fast enough. What we, did, what we started doing, we started um, a vaccination um, protocol that as soon as an animal comes in intake, they're all vaccinated. They are. Wow. And that, it ended up, it didn't cost us any more because it actually got the animals out faster. So if you look at your overhead, that's what we wanted. Exactly. Um, 
we have a vet tech, we have a certified vet tech, mm -hmm. and not very many animal shelters do, I mean, at a county facility have right. certified techs. They have vet techs, but not certified. And she works, we've changed her uh, uh, procedures that she reports directly to Chris and to the vet. And if mm -hmm. there's any animals in that shelter that's gonna be put down, they have to be signed off by the vet has to say yes, and Chris has to sign off on it. Wow. So it's greatly changed, and I think it's actually changed the attitude of the staff, because the staff didn't want to have to euthanize these animals. It was right. very stressful on them too. So I think we've we've got a good system going, wouldn't yeah. you agree? Gina, I'd like to uh, add something about Dr. Luke. Yeah. Um, one of my duties in Manatee County is as a public safety director is that I'm also responsible for emergency medical services or the county ambulance system. Mm -hmm. And I have a medical director. He's a doctor. Mm -hmm. We operate our county ambulance system under his medical license and he directs our protocols. He signs off on our protocols. He tests our, our, our drivers and our, our paramedics. Mm -hmm. We wanted that concept mm -hmm. in. Yes animal services and uh, Luke volunteered to do that I, with a little coercion he volunteered <laughs> nice to do coercion. that. Right. So um, <laughs> he, he, he reviews all of our protocols, he looks at our, our medicine protocols, he looks at our you know our sanitary protocols, yeah. our sanitation protocols. It's made a huge difference. Even the time we fed him. You know when you're coming in to adopt an animal and if you feed, if you keep food in the animal's dish all day long you have issues. Yeah. And Luke goes, in my, in my practice, I feed them at one time of the day right. in the morning, exactly right. and then in little the afternoon, like they're ado more adoptable. So right. little things like that in the private sector that it's you wouldn't have thought of. It's called they're on the poop of. schedule. Yeah, well, I didn't exactly want to say that for it. television, but. <laughs> That's great. I love it. So it, it's, right. it's, it's, he's fantastic, and it's been well. And when we have an injured animal, we have the emergency room, we have a backup emergency room that we can use that right. we, if we absolutely have to, and then we have Dr. Luke. So it's worked out right. well. Um, Chris, talk a little bit about the um, the behavioral side of this, um, and specifically, I'm talking about the new volunteer program you have going called the Pit Crew. Um, that that has turned out to be a huge success. What they did is I allowed, um, or the the staff had come to me asking, of course, 70, 80 percent of the of the dogs that we get in are pit or pit mix right. dogs. So. Um, they have a reputation they're kind of uh, difficult to get adopted. Mm -hmm. So what they came up with is the American Kennel Club, the AKC, has a Canine Good Citizenship Award that they can get, uh, that, the, that the dog can get when it goes through all the basic commands. Um, there's a trainer that volunteered to do this, and they've grown their volunteer group, I think, up to almost 20 people now mm -hmm. that come out every Wednesday night. They take our pit bull dogs that are in that pit uh, pit crew program, and they learn, teach them the basic commands: the sit, the stay, the um, the heel. And the good thing is, is I don't think that we've had one yet that is able to even get through the program because they get adopted. Well, that's, that's so right amazing. From it. I know that up until that started, we were basically looking for ways to offload pit bulls. Right. Somebody right. else take them because right. we didn't Marketing know what to programs. do with them. Yeah, right, right. exactly. Right. So this really is a, a change, a switch. It and is, and there's so a plus valuable. to it as well too. Even that adopter has the opportunity to come back and complete that right. program. Wow, so, For that's free. wonderful. And that's free, no For charge. Free. Okay, let's talk PR. The, uh, step number eight in the no-kill equation is public relations and community involvement. Now, I know that uh, I can hear Nathan Winograd mm -hmm. saying, get in the press every day. <laughs> Every day, every day, every day, find a reason to be in there. And it makes sense because the press, whether, well, when I say the press, whether it's you know, TV, radio, newspapers, they have newspapers to fill. Mm -hmm. They're looking for materials. Mm -hmm. So when you come along with a good human interest story or a mm -hmm. good happy story or a, or a column like you have on, what's your column called? I've forgotten. It's called A, a View to No Kill. A view. I, a view uh, got to it. no a view kill. To no kill. Yes. Okay. They, they most likely will go for it. I mean, we've been very successful. And that has to do with community involvement, even like we were at the county fair last week, um, eating ourselves silly and, <laughs> and just being there with the no-kill booth to tell people what no-kill was about and to sell them T-shirts, right. of course, to make some money also. But why else is, how else do we do PR? Sue, I know you're the expert at PR. What did we do last weekend? 
Well, last weekend we had some people that came to me that wanted to hold a beer festival. They wanted to do it for a charitable organization. So I'd call them my beer musketeers. They came in, they ran the event and donated the money to us. And that's what's buying the van for wow. the transport. So it's very important to have all that press. I think the best press we've had lately is Axel. Oh, yes. Which was a dog that had a, a horrendous hit in the head with a hatchet. And we set up a Facebook page for that dog and everybody I think all knows about world, Axel. I had Facebook. Yeah, mm -hmm. and oh, Axel Lord. was treated by Dr. Luke. We've had the pictures out of when he had the stitches put in his head, when he had them out of his head. He's now in a foster home with a trainer who's training him, right. and we will be looking for a home for him soon. So that, that kind of press was just continual with right. people and following Axel. you mentioned Axel. something to me the other day. You know, of course, raising funds is a huge part of No Kill. Yes. We know that um, because we can't get county funds. Raising the funds mm -hmm. matters. And you mentioned something that I think is really important, is that our first efforts when we were out doing PR was to get people to know what's no-kill. Yes. You know, what is it? What are you doing there yes. and why? Yes. Now, the name recognition is huge. Yeah. The now no they're kill. coming up to us and now saying you're doing a good job. Now they're coming to us yes. and saying, we yes. want to put on an yes. event. Would you like to be the recipient? Yes. Which is great. Yes. That's amazing. Mm -hmm. You know, that's a real shift. And that's yeah. a wonderful way. First comes the work, you know, mm -hmm. and then when you get out there comes the recognition yes. and the yes. support from mm -hmm. the community. Yeah. It's great. I love it. Okay. That takes us to volunteers. We've talked a little bit about volunteers already and the importance of volunteers. Mm -hmm. you know, I don't think we could live without the volunteer. I don't think we could be successful without volunteers. Talk about some of our volunteer programs, if you would, anybody, really, that have been successful. I just want before, uh, and these, the people here on the panel can talk about, I just want to explain when we made this commitment as governmental agency to the public, we said we will do this with no funds, but we can't do this without volunteers. Right. Mm -hmm. To have 300 people show up in so many hours, mm -hmm. it, it's it. We we get a new idea every day. The scanner for the mold, for the uh, the the please the, the officers. officers came from a citizen at a restaurant and said, "Hey, why don't you do this?" Right. Um, so if it wasn't for the volunteers, we would not be where right. we are today. And every county that I go, when I go to the Florida League County, they said, "How do you do it?" I said, "Well, you have to have." the support, but you have to have the volunteers. Right. Yes. So this is very important. Right, and you may have seen, I don't know if it was Sue or me or whoever saw a CBS news story on Sunday, CBS Sunday morning Picture. about uh, the success of a program that was taking good photographs mm -hmm. of dogs and cats that were in the, their local shelter and they upped their rate of, of right. being adopted by like 80% or some picture crazy number and, yes. and picture them adopted came into being which is our local uh, version of that which is volunteer both amateur and professional photographers who come out and take photographs of the dogs and cats rather than the photographs they used to get behind mm -hmm. gates behind fences yeah. held on leashes scared to death when they first came in yeah. They take wonderful photographs of pit bulls on velvet chairs. Where'd um, you get that chair? You know, <laughs> yes, I, got, I gave that chair. No, Craigslist. I never, I never believed in the power of the internet. Oh, okay. Yeah. Till now. I, uh, and I see it. Yes. I see it with our own foster dogs. Yes. It's amazing. Absolutely. Those pitches sell those animals. People come from yes. far and wide. I cannot believe that people will travel yeah. to adopt a dog even in another state if they have People's to. hearts they are fall moved in love by photographs. With a Yep. Yeah, yes. absolutely, absolutely. So we have Picture Them Adopted. What other volu all volunteer-run programs do we have? We have the PIT program. Walgreens. Walgreens. Talk about Walgreens. Oh, oh yeah. yes, Walgreens. They're um, wonderful. Well, uh, Walgreens was, um, and Home Speech, actually, it was Walgreens and Home Speech saw that we were looking at ways to help with the no-kill, and she called and said, I have an idea. I'm going to put a barrel in every one of my stores and talk all my managers in all of Manatee County mm -hmm. so when there's a sale on an animal food or whatever that they just throw in donations. So Sue and I got together and we looked at, we decided and with the staff here, what agencies are actually pulling from Manatee County to helping mm -hmm. us with this mm -hmm. mission. And those that pulled the most what rescues? were rewarding yeah. yeah, the, the rescues were um, actually rewarding them by letting them have all the food that goes right. in the barrels. Right. right. It's great. And it's been going well. And we it's mentioned you all well. mentioned before the dog walker program, which is wonderful. Yes, and dog washers. And the dog wash. and dog they washers, dogs. maybe once a month we have a program. We've had Girl Scout troops come out to Absolutely. wash dogs. Yes. Cat and the cuddlers. dogs love it, right? Yeah. And cat cuddlers. 
people just come in and play with the cats, brush them, do their right. nails if they right. know how. It's wonderful. wonderful. One thing that we is also needed that's very important that it seems insignificant is greeters. People uh -huh. that can greet the people that want to adopt when yes. they walk in the door, because the staff at Animal Services doesn't have time. So we're currently looking for a staff of greeters. Okay. Yeah. There's a very small staff at Animal Services yes. to take care yes. of the dogs and cats. And so, yeah, that is, I can see that as the next frontier. Absolutely. Is to have volunteer greeters, volunteer adoption counselors. Yes. You know. yes. If I can address that, um, uh, to, to reinforce it, we have the same or fewer people today doing all these programs that you hear everyone yeah. talking about right. as we had when we were the dog right. pound. Right. One of the differences is they're far more highly motivated than they were when they were just oh. warehousing and morale. Morale. The, morale. Go the government yeah. has been under uh, tough pressure mm -hmm. over the last five years and so it's been impossible to expand our staff and yeah. one of the things that I would like to see animal services achieve is independence from uh, the general fund, you know, they can raise their own money, they can hire their own people. We desperately great. need a volunteer coordinator. Yes, yeah. I agree. And I have to okay. thank the county administrator and, and the staff for actually allowing us yeah. to do this. If it wasn't yes. for him to support this to get before the commission, this wouldn't have never happened, right. and our staff. So I just right. want to thank them. And Carol. Okay. Proactive and redemptions, that's a, a, we'll hit this sort of quickly. What does that mean? What's a, what's a redemption? I don't think their souls are being saved, so what do we think? <laughs> Redemption is, is somebody coming in and claiming their animal. Ah, someone, the animal's in animal services, right. and now they, right. they know about it. Right. And has that increased with you know, social media and it has with the with with our computer program the way that it is allowing uh, where people can be allowed to look at our website and see the lost and found that are available. Yeah, okay, good. Um, what about, Bill, our last, the last step, and maybe the most important step, Nathan Winograd, I've heard him say it's the most important step in the, the journey to no-kill, is a compassionate director at Animal Services. So I want you, Chris, you can just close your ears or whatever, to talk about <laughs> Chris a little bit. Well. Just, and really, it's a way of saying, what changes have you seen in Chris since we started this journey? Well, Chris always, had the compassion for the animals, but he was overwhelmed. I mean, he had more animals than he could say grace over, and he, mm -hmm. and, and I think, you know, before Chris got there, there was a 20, 30 year legacy, a history of mm -hmm. Manatee County dog pound. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, you, 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 your life experiences shape what you do and what you know and what you think and that's basically what they were doing. They were right. continuing that program. Um, there had to be a better way and he knew there had to be a better way. We had many conversations and uh, I think the, um, the uh, Nathan Winograd trip was the catalyst and the, the uh, point that Nathan always makes is that the program starts with a will, yes. with a decision. An act of will. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Absolutely. And we did that. I would like to go around and get sort of, I don't I want to call them closing statements because believe it or not, we're running out of time. It's gone so fast. Mm -hmm. um, a couple of sentences or two of, you know, where are you? What do you think about no kill? Where do you think we are? Where do you think we need to go? Whatever you want to say, basically. Mary. I think we're in a good place now, but it can only get better. Yeah. And my one closing sentence is going to be, don't shop when you can adopt. <laughs> That's great. great Thank you. Perfect. Sue? Perfect. Mine is that we need all the people that can do any small part of the no-kill to please come forward and help. We need the volunteers, great. and we appreciate every volunteer that we have. Great. Chris? And my big thing, of course, is on the, the no-kill part of it, that other counties have already joined us, not only in this state, but across the nation, and that one day the vow or hope is that we will be a no-kill nation. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. Bill? I watched uh, Carol f organize and form the summit group. Yeah. And that's where the rescues come together. And the common theme that all the rescues have is that there are just never enough fosters. Yeah. So if you can foster, get in oh. touch with your rescue. Right. Please. Yeah. Carol? And I just want to thank everyone for coming to me and giving me the honor to help you 
accomplish what you did. Again, I'm just the messenger, and um, I just want to thank. It's been an honor working with everyone, and we're not done. And there's other, a lot, many other things we're working on every day. Right. But I want to thank everyone. Thank you, and thank you all for joining us. Thanks for going on the journey to No Kill with us today. I thank all the participants, uh, not just for appearing here, really, but for what they do every day for animals. We're on our way to No Kill. Not quite there yet, but we are well on our way. Nathan Winograd, the father of the No Kill movement, says, we have the power to build a new consensus which rejects killing as a method for achieving results. And we look forward to a time when the wholesale slaughter of animals is viewed as a cruel aberration of the past. It's the hope of everyone here and in the community that all of Florida will follow in the footsteps of Manatee County so that we can be the first no-kill state in this nation. Thank you for joining us.